Harry Hamlin, you made me pagan. Hmm. I wonder if any other witches or pagans have ever said that before. Hey all my amazing witchkin out there. Um, this is my second attempt at doing my first YouTube Pagan Tones video. I, after I uploaded it, I realized I didn't quite like it, so I thought I would have a second go at it and re-edit, re-upload, all that you get it. Um, so I wanted to talk about how I found my path and as I like to say, I've been a witch before it was cool. I've been a witch for more than 20 years. In fact, I even have the gray hair to prove it. Um, it really started back when I was in elementary school, into junior high school. I've always had an interest in the occult and superna supernatural mysteries such as psychic phenomena, Atlantis, uh, this, that, and the other. Um, uh, mythology was, was always a big interest in my life. Um, it, it really started with the first time I saw Class of the Titans, the original, the original 1980s film on TV. I believe it was on TNT back when I was really young. And I think TNT still plays every now and then. Um, but I, I, I actually about 10 or 15 years ago found a copy of the DVD. So I've, I've, um, I've owned that now. It's a treasured part of my DVD collection and I break it out and watch it about once a year, about as often as I watch Practical Magic. Um, but, um, God, yeah, um, well, I, actually, even though they would discredit that Mormons also had an influence on me, as strange as it may sound, um, I was Mormon for a brief period of time in the very early 90s, um, when I began to enter my teenage years, um, excuse me, but, um, you know, we would have philosophical discussions, and um, because their theology is that God used to be a, a physical mortal human being who because of his, uh, his let's call it perf perfection, you know, he was just like the perfect epitome of virtue to them, that he was given the ability to create um, his own planet, his own society, where he would birth his own spirit children, if you will. And, of course, he had a wife. And I thought to myself, well, gee, if God has a wife, why don't we know her name? You know, I give the missionaries a bit of a side eye for that, because they say that um, the God's name is Jehovah. And it just um, seems to me that she should have a name also. But they cautioned me. They said, we don't pray to her, you know, kind of dismissively like that. Even though, you know, I have, um, um, after they told me that they do in fact believe in her, that there's actually a statue of her in the, the Salt Lake City Temple, if you've ever been there. I, I have not, but um, most people I hear just um, believe it's, it's the Virgin Mary, when in fact it, it actually is supposed to be um, God's wife, you know, the the goddess, um, quote-unquote, because they don't really believe in that, um, but, you know, it, it really sparked my belief in, in the feminine principle very early on, um, but it was, you know, as I said, it was really class of the Titans that got me really, really interested in mythology, and back in high school, or no, not high school, but um, elementary school, I really couldn't find anything there in the, in, the, in the school library, 
but it was in junior high at the high school library that I found one of my favorite books on mythology, on Greek mythology. It was an illustrated book. Um, you almost certainly know of it. I, I can't think of the title of it now because I don't actually own a copy of it. But I would like to one day as a memento. Um, watching Class of the Titans, and in fact watching every movie, almost every movie that's ever been made on classical mythology, I, I, I've been wondering lately, why is it that they never choose an actor to portray Zeus that is um, muscular and fit? I mean, Zeus was a fucking muscle daddy. Come on. Um, you know, send your actors to the gym. Make them bulk up to really portray Zeus as he ought to be, as he ought to be portrayed. Uh, God, you know, that, that always bums me out just a little bit when I see a, a portrayal of Zeus on film or, in, or, or, or on TV. Um, also because they always really just heap the clothing onto him. But if you've ever seen any cult images of Zeus, he's always very sparsely dressed, very, um... Um, well, the Greeks loved their bodies. You know, they often showed off their bodies. You know, uh, this is not new. Um, I, I think part of the reason is because of, well, filmmakers, even if they're from Europe, they try and create films and uh, movies that would be, that would not offend an American audience. And if you show too much of the male body, uh, the female body we can handle for some reason, but but it's a nude male body that we find extremely uncomfortable here in America for some reason, and I, I just don't get that, you know. Um, it's, it's just a body, you know, he's just portraying a character, don't want to bother you, but yeah, it, that's how many European company, film companies actually water down films, just for an American audience, which, which is ridiculous, but I'm getting off topic here. Um, I, it was um, back in junior high school that I actually um, began reading at the, um, let's see, it was the high school library, and it was the public library in Stewart that I found one of my favorite books at the time, which is um, Brian Froud's Berries. And this is actually my second copy of this book. This is the 25th anniversary ed edition. I originally owned a hard co hardcover copy of the original 1980 edition before it went into softcover press. Um, but yeah, God, I, I used to read this book at the public library in Stewart, cover to cover, so often I practically had it memorized. Um, uh, but that was one influence on me as I began to find my own path, my own way in the in the witchly world. Uh, it was you know um, shortly after uh, when I was when I was a little older, I think about in high school, I actually read uh, Margaret Adler's book *Drawing Down the Moon*, which was a wonderful book. It still is, even though the more recent um, publication of the book um, omitted some of the more risque photographs featuring female nudity, even though I think that was a bad decision to make. Um, it included new chapters, which I appreciate, except the fact that Margo was had a very bowing and scraping tone towards Professor Ronald Hutton when she was mentioning him in the book, even though Hutton himself had vilified her horribly in in his book, The Pagan Religions of the Ancient British Isles. You know, just just really slamming her. And and I um I was curious about that. So I, I was lucky enough to communicate with her briefly while she was still alive and I and I asked her about that. And her answer was very forthright, which I really appreciate. She simply said that she had no idea uh, of um Hutton's book the pagan religions of the ancient british isles and she's never read it which i i can appreciate that um uh the the skeptic in me um 
maybe wonders if that's true or not, because if you really have an interest in history, especially ancient history, his earlier book is something you might show an interest in also, even though that book in particular is a travesty of logical fallacies. It's it's just one of the worst books you can read on ancient paganism. It really is. It's it's um well it's 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 not correct by a long shot. And one of these days I will actually uh, go at length about my views of the book itself. I'll, I'll probably even have to reread the book to um, give a blow-by-blow blow on 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 how on what a travesty it really is. And in fact, all of his books really show um, very poor reasoning skills, and they just don't think through their subject matter in great detail. It, it's as, as though he's trying to prove. Um, a very conservative, conservative case by um, invoking many logical fallacies and even using sweeping umbrella statements and putting his own opinion forth as though it's an axiomatic fact. But again, I'm totally getting off topic here. But it, it, it was really um, in college that I first heard the word Wicca. I, I really didn't have any idea what Wicca was. Um, I had never really, well, I, I just hadn't really heard the term, um, until that point. It was, um, in the college library, actually, I was, um, the internet was new, in, in Iowa anyway, you know, um, very few people had access to the internet except colleges. Um, even the public libraries then didn't have internet access for the most part. You know, now we take it for granted, it's everywhere but back then it, uh, you really couldn't access it. in fact for the first several months of college you know no one was allowed to access the internet unless they had a passcode from the librarians but um, um, I was um, glancing over the shoulder of some friends one day when I saw them in the, in the library and they were looking at this really interesting looking computer screen you know uh, the internet was new then. It was all dial-up, the dreadful days of dial-up, and computers, uh, um, websites were very, very cheaply rendered. They were, um, well, they, they were much more simple than than they are now. But um, it 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 immediately sparked my interest because it was all these images of crystals and their magical uses, and I have always had a very large interest in crystals. Um, I have a modest collection of crystals that I bought years and years and years ago. These crystals have got to be about 30 years old now. I bought them in, um, in Des Moines, Iowa at David's Briar Shop. Which is a little store at a at, at the Merle Hay Mall in Des Moines. They no longer sell crystals, but I remember at the time I bought them, they had they, uh, the store owner actually gave out these little two or three page um, stapled sheets of paper with the names of crystals and their occult uses on them, and I kept that for many, 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 many years until I finally lost it some, somewhere. You know, I really wish that I still had it. But they no longer carry crystals. They um, they don't really even remember the guy that used to bring crystals into them. In fact, there's really no store in Des Moines at, at all. The, well, there's no proper rock shop in Des Moines now, and uh, the price of crystals has gone up. You know, it's, it's just skyrocketed. This small bag of crystals here could easily fetch at least a hundred dollars today. Yet I paid, got at least a dollar for each crystal there. I have chloride, um, sodalite, pyrite, pyrox, um, pyrox or quartz crystal, rose quartz, amethyst, um, uh, not citrine, but um, calcite, yellow calcite, and adventurine. 
Um, but yeah, those those stores are hard to come by. I see occult stores nowadays selling chips, chips of rose quartz, not even good quality rose quartz for like ten dollars a piece. That is ridiculous. Um, so anyway, I um. I, you know, began looking at these websites and really um, using a search engine because, you know, everyone used Yahoo back then. It was before Google was a thing. And um, I just began searching, you know, crystal magic, um, Wicca, terms like that. And they brought up some, some really inter interesting early websites at, at the time. It was about the time that Witch Fox first came onto the scene. And I used to read their news site, uh, um, uh, Ren's Nest. I, I miss Ren's Nest. Um, it's when Ren Walker used to have her, her blog on the, on the side. I'm not sure if she's still blogging or not, but she's planning on writing a book. I think I, I think it's her memoir. She's a wonderful woman. I really adore her. Um, yeah, I used to get a lot of information from Witch, Witch Box, um, but one of the first sites I was on, I can't recall the name of it now, but all I recall from it is that it was a very pale gray or whitish colored background. It was just a simple message board, and there was a, um, a, a spider web motif in one of the corners, I think. Um, you know, a, a background there that was new, things were much more simple than they are now. You, you had to do more with less, basically. And I asked the mess, uh, I asked people on the message board if they could re recommend any books. And there was one book, well, one author really in particular, that they kept uh, recommending time and time again. And looking back on it now, I really wish that they had recommended a different author. Um, because nowadays I'm, I'm more about quality over quantity. Um, because, you know, I, I won't name names with this author in particular. This author's approach seemed to be, um, I will give example after example after example and hope that something sticks. Um, she really seemed to think, um, she really seemed to want people to use her own spells, her own invocations, because of course that keeps you in in readers. And many many authors have really followed suit since that book was published back in the mid '90s. And that is how many pagan authors nowadays make their money by keeping authors really or keeping readers really reliant on their their own books for their source of magic and spells and potions and whatnot, rather than teaching their readers how to do for themselves. Because I was really I really wanted to do for myself. I wanted to create my my own circle circle casting my own quarter calls my own spells and potions because to me that has much more meaning to me than something that I could just get from someone else's book I want to put in the work myself um, even though nowadays we live in a day and age and in fact even back in the late 90s there was still a culture of um, people not wanting to to put in the work themselves, that they they wanted e wanted easy answers. They wanted um, well. I have seen many people tout that their book of shadows is nothing more than someone else's book, some uh, else's published book, or their book of shadows is nothing more than a three ring binder filled with um, other people's spells that they just found online. Um, oftentimes, they've told me that the reason they don't want to create their own spells is because they're afraid of their own powers. They're afraid that that they might do something wrong and and havoc or, or catastrophe would ensue, which is extremely unlikely. You know, um, in all the years I've been practice, practicing, none of that has ever happened to me. Um, perhaps a spell hasn't worked out precisely as intended, but that's usually when I put all my eggs in one basket rather than focusing on this goal now and other goals later on in the line. Um, yeah, um, but this author spent the better part of three books in a series explaining poorly 
what other authors were able to do in the space of one very succinct, amazing book. In fact, some of those influential authors were Laura Kevitt's Power of the Witch and the Ferraras. The Witch's Way. Um, this was actually a gift to me from a friend, and I cherish it. I, I, I absolutely cherish it because this hardback is actually not the easiest to find, and usually when people do sell it, they uh, command a lot of money for it, which is a shame because it's a wonderful book, and I've, I've always loved the hardbacks over the compiled soft cover book because after I was barely halfway done with the soft cover edition of um, the Witch's Bible, a title that the Farrars actually hated from the publisher, um, the book was just falling apart. And, you know, um, this way I have something much more durable. But, um, yeah, Laura's book, I, I am convinced, found its way to me um, in answer to a prayer, um, nothing that I had really spoken out loud. It was just an internal prayer, something from my heart um, that I was really having. I was really questioning witchcraft itself, not the religious aspect of it, but the magical aspect of it. And this book came to me at a time when um, when I really needed those answers. And it explained the craft to me and and witchcraft in terms of of the mind, the psyche, as well as quantum mechanics and physics, which is something that I really needed at that time because I was very analytical and left brain. Even though I'm a Pisces, I I still have um, a very anal analytical side now and again. Um, so because this book actually meant so much to me, I went out a few years ago and I hunt, or not a few years ago, about 10 years ago, and I hunted down a near mint condition hard, um, hardback copy. In fact, I really need to buy, find, buy a dust jacket for this book um, just to preserve it a lot more. Um, but there are several authors who have actually influenced, influenced me and my path over the years, um, such as Laura Cabot, of course, and the Farrars, as well as Doreen Valiente, Gerald Gardner, um, uh, Starhawk. Um, not really her book, The Spiral Dance. That really wasn't as influential to me as was her book, um, uh, Crap, I'm spacing on the name of it. Um, Truth or Dare, I think. If I'm wrong, I will correct myself down below. Um, uh, Anna Fran my friend, my British friend, Anna Franklin, um, her work has also been a huge influence to me as a witch, um, especially her book, Herbcraft and Familiars. Um, it, it really led me to working with animal powers quite a bit more in my practice, and it, she really helped me to discern when I was really being called by a familiar, a new animal power. In fact, I have three that I work with um, semi-regularly. Um, I have snake, owl, and spider. Um, and interestingly enough, um, all three of my familiars are associated with witchcraft, the occult, and the underworld which I, I think is really interesting. Uh, one of the other authors who has really influenced me, um, influenced by magic, is actually actually the work of Lady Rhea, who is a darling of New York City. Um, her magic, The Enchanted Candle, is um, uh, one of the staples of that area of witchcraft, uh, as well as, um, as the formulary. Um, her, her work with oils is also one of the staples of that area as well. So that is also another intro, um, an influential figure of mine that has really influenced me as I have developed my path as a witch. In fact, um, um, even though I could recommend every single book that, I, um, that has influenced me as a witch to you, it doesn't necessarily mean that you would um, come to the exact same conclusions that I have reached. As a witch. Another point I wanted to make was that I, I no longer consider myself Wiccan. Um, I really dropped that name um, 
about 15 years ago, I think, because um, there was really a lot of drama in the pagan community about who can and who cannot use that that word to describe themselves. A lot of witches and pagans who weren't even initiated uh, Gardnerians or Alexandrians of any sort um, took it upon themselves to be the occult police and they would just virtually thrash anyone that, that called themselves a, a Wiccan or said that they followed Wicca even though they were not initiated. But then you also have another branch of so-called Wiccans that really diluted the craft. And so now we have Neo-Wicca, which is what most of the public think of. When they think of it as Wicca, they don't think of, of Wicca seriously. So now when they think of Wicca, they think of, of what we call Neo-Wiccan, sort of the white light, fluff bunny variety that, um, that has really watered down the craft quite substantially away from its more virile roots. Um, so I just shake my head at the thought of having neo Wiccan nowadays, but it's it's with us now, so I guess I have just got to cope with it uh, as much as I don't want to. Um, in fact, um, there was actually a time when I almost dropped the craft completely because I was being so horribly bullied by um, a bunch of gay pagans, which really, really surprised me. They were actually, actually the first pagans I had ever encountered online, and they treated me horribly. Um, just because I had a different position from them, and because I was still learning they just looked down on me and they tried they treated me so horribly i almost dropped their craft completely and when that fact got back to them they actually um gloated in in, in that that they had almost driven driven me out of the craft um not because i was still learning but because of their bad behavior towards me and um, the irony is actually that the, the one of the one of the men who who instigated this behavior, it came back to me about fifteen years ago that he himself is no longer involved in the craft, that he's he's really um, 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 put it by the wayside, really. So really, you know, the moral of the story is. Uh, treat people well. Treat people as you would like to be treated. And if they're learning, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, there's no reason to be a total asshole to anyone. Just one other point I, I, I really wanted to make about my my own path is that um, about, 15, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago, maybe more like 12 years ago, I um I became a herbalist and that is really another influence upon my path as a witch that it was my way of really um it, it was an extension of my desire to serve others to serve my community um, even though my own family doesn't really accept the concept of herb herbalism in any way they they hate herbs and flavor as food and they really just distrust using herbs to treat common symptoms and ailments. Uh, which is unfortunate, but you know, um, we live in a modern society and it's hard to convince people to try older techniques to try and absolve their, their issues. But you know, that's, that's, that's me, that is my evolution as a witch. I hope you have enjoyed this video and um, I'm sure that some of my future pagan, uh, YouTube pagan challenge videos might not be quite so long, maybe not quite so boring, but I really hope you enjoyed this one and I look to hearing from you again.